Our gospel lesson for today is from the book of Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So the Pharisees went and took counsel about how to entangle Jesus in his talk. They sent their disciples to him along with Herodians and said, Teacher, we know that you're true. You teach the way of God faithfully. You care for no one, for you do not regard their position. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the money for the tax. And so they brought him a coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is on this? He said, Caesar's. Then Jesus said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled. And they went away and left him be. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless this word that we hear today. Inspire us with your Holy Spirit that we might hear it and receive it. If we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Today's lesson is not going to please everyone. But I want to make sure I keep coming back to the scripture to prove my point to what Jesus said today. Because I think Jesus' words directly are applicable to the conflict that is going on in our country and across the world today. We have Christians, some on the right and some on the left, who want to impose a particular worldview upon everybody. It's called totalitarianism. By the way, I don't care whether it's right-wing Christianity and you agree with it or left-wing Christianity and you agree with it, but they believe it is God's will for them to impose this point of view upon the world. And this is in total contradiction to what Jesus said in the Bible today. Total contradiction. We Christians are the cause of the great conflict that exists in a great part of this world today especially in the United States. You want to know why there's conflict? It's because Christians are on the right and the left and pushing for a particular political agenda that has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but yet they represent it as Jesus. Okay, so now that I've offended just about all of you, I'm going to prove my point. Because it's all about what Jesus says. It's not about my opinion, and there will be things in here that are my opinion. And I will make sure I'm very clear about that. And even on those things that I believe are what Jesus is trying to say, you are welcome to disagree with me and challenge me on these things. We're not a totalitarian church. We don't believe imposing our interpretive method or view upon you in order for you to be faithful to be here at this church. You can disagree with the pastor and still be a faithful member. And I can tell you, there are faithful members of the church who vehemently disagree with me. I have communists in our church. I have Donald Trump voters in our church, okay? And we've got everybody in between. Most people are in between, but we've got the extremes. Your opinion is welcome. But I want to talk today about Jesus and what he said about our dual citizenship we are dual citizens of both the kingdom of heaven and of this country. And there is a way in which that competing or conflicting sometimes citizenships are meant to interact. Obviously our priority is the kingdom of heaven. Our, that is where our priority is. Not to country, but to the kingdom of heaven. But even when our priority is the kingdom of heaven comes in conflict of the country, how do we respond to this? Jesus gives us a clue today about what this means. So before we get into there, let's remember a couple of things about the season in which we're in, the season after Pentecost, which is green. It means that these lessons are meant to challenge us. We are supposed to grow and really wrestle with these lessons. But we also need to remember in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew has basically two broad sections. The first half of the Gospel of Matthew is about who do people say that I am? What's the identity of Jesus? 
Once the identity of Jesus is discovered as the Messiah, the entirety of the rest of it is all about the cross and the results of the cross and the results for the, those who would be left behind after Christ died and rose again. So this is all about, we're in that second half. It's all about the impact of what it means to live under the cross in this world. So let's take a look at this. So Jesus is still in the temple. You can't take these passages out of context. Don't just read these passages until you know the surrounding context of what's going on. So I'm going to flesh out some of that. I encourage you, if you've not been following along these last week, few weeks, to read this for yourself. But Jesus is in the temple. He's on the offensive. Remember, he's come in and triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He goes into the temple, overturns the tables, and has created some conflict. And the scribes, uh, the, the, the religious leaders confront him and say, Why are you doing this to us? Oh, you're taking away our prophet. Blah, blah, blah. And Jesus is now still sitting here preaching in the temple. And he's on the offensive. He is attacking, 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 attacking. And you wonder why the scribes and the Pharisees killed Jesus, right? They can't handle this anymore. He's in their place of business attacking them, okay? The religious leaders who think they're good, but they attempt to manipulate God for personal gain, will be left out of the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus just said last week. The least likely, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners, they will be the ones that will be opened up, the kingdom will be open to, they will be most welcome. And it demonstrates the generosity and the great love of God. So now in the midst of this, this is just after these lessons that we just heard, the Herodians and the Pharisees, they gather together and they come up with a counterattack to hit Jesus hard in a way that he's going to be flustered, at least they think. Now, I want to tell you how astonishing a thing it is that the scribes and the Pharisees are colluding together. It is amazing, and I am serious about this. It is like a Donald Trump voter and a progressive gets together for a common cause and says, let's work together. That's how radical the Pharisees and the Herodians coming together is. It is something that never happened before. These two groups were so at odds with each other, they hated each other. The Herodians would be considered the political left wing. The Pharisees would have been the political right wing of Jesus' day, okay? So they send some disciples. Jesus knows who these guys are. So they send their disciples. These would be unknown to Jesus. So they're hoping to take them by surprise so that Jesus wouldn't immediately identify them as Pharisees or Herodians. Okay? Like I said, the thing that brings these two guys together is their hatred of Jesus. Oh. They had a power base they had to protect. So they hoped to catch Jesus off guard and entrap him. Now, one of the things I find very interesting is you notice they're not contesting Jesus on the Bible. Because they've tried that before. And no matter what they say about the Bible, Jesus comes and, and traps them. <laughs> Retraps them. The trap never works. It always traps themselves. So instead what they do is they come with him with a civic question. How does our dual citizenship work? The kingdom of heaven, our relationship to country. How does this work? They wanted to catch him in something. No matter what he said, he's going to either upset the Romans or the zealots. The zealots who wanted to overthrow the Romans or the Roman government itself. That's what they're hoping for. And so the question, it's a manufactured question. Again, trying to come up with a question that put pits our citizenship to the kingdom of heaven and country at risk. Again, civic and the kingdom of heaven responsibilities. Should a good Jew, should a good Jew, who's faithful to God, to the kingdom of heaven, pay taxes to the occupying Roman forces? 
Now, a little bit about taxes, and by the way, if you are following this on YouTube, uh, you need to go to our Facebook page because there is a download of our sermon handout for today. You may need this to follow along. Just pause the sermon, go download it from our Facebook page. There is an advertisement for today's ser uh, sermon. You can download it. You may need it so you don't get lost, but it might also be important to you. You might want to keep this and study this. So the Jews paid three taxes, kind of four, but they three, paid three taxes to Rome and to Jerusalem. They paid what was called a ground tax. So one-tenth of their grain and one-fifth of all their oil that they produced had to be handed over to the Romans. They had paid an income tax, 1% of their total cash income that they took in. So if they sold the remaining grain or the remaining oils or whatever their sales were, they would then have to pay 1% uh, of that in cash income to the Roman government. They also paid a poll, P-O-L-L -L, tax, which is equivalent to one day's wage. But then there was a fourth tax that was a particular to the Jews. They paid a temple tax. Now again, sometimes people would pay upwards of whatever, 10%, that's kind of uh, what we think of as the tithe, but that's a tough thing to figure when you're in a, a culture that doesn't trade in cash. How do you figure that out? And but to be honest with you, I have some concerns about folks who are adamant about tithing, 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 because I'll be frank, a tithe is not an equivalent amount of income. It may be equivalent in terms of math, but it is not equivalent in terms of how it impacts a person. A person who makes $20,000 a year and gives 10% of their income is giving way more money than the person who makes a million dollars in giving 10% of their money. Uh, that is Jesus math, by the way. If you got a million dollars and you're only giving 10%, that's nothing. You still got $900,000 left. If you have $20,000, you're on the limits right now and on the edge, and you give $2,000, that's way more generous than a person who has a million dollars. So it's not proportional. So I, I think we have to get rid of this idea that the tithe is the standard. There's other standards. It's about generosity and about love. And that's determined by our relationship with God and how strong that is and our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I am not one of those that adamantly tithe, tithe, tithe. I don't think that's biblical. I don't think that's Jesus. That's very Old Testament. But Jesus comes and brings a new way. Okay? But the temple tax was something that they would give that would help support those who worked in the religious profession at the temple. Okay? The priests. The scribes. By asking this question about this conflict between kingdom of heaven and country, thought they had Jesus in a no-win situation. If Jesus says, remember, here's what the question is, should we pay taxes to the Roman government, the occupying forces? If he says no, he, oh, well, you know what? The zealots are happy. Yeah, Jesus is on our side. Oh, man, but he's got the Roman government now against him. He becomes a seditionist. Right? If he answers yes, the people who hate Rome are now against Jesus, but Rome is happy. But his own people are going to hate him now. Oh, clever question, right? It is a clever question. So here's Jesus. He answers even more cleverly. <laughs> cleverly? Whatever. I have no clue where that's a word. Cleverly, more cleverly, more clever. There he is. He's more clever in his answer. He takes a coin and he holds it up. And he says, whose image is on this coin? It's the image of Caesar. Well, <laughs> coins were considered the property of the person who minted them and whose face was on it. So if Caesar's face is on that coin, it belonged to Caesar. He said, give it back to him. Who cares? Because... We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, right? That's a country thing. Just do it. That's what they ask, do it. Jesus delineated the dual citizenship of the 
person of God. We are citizens of a country. Our country provides us with protection, infrastructure. It provides us with the opportunity. Whether it's a good country or not is not the point. So we got people all panicking about our country. Some think it's such an unjust country and they hate our country. Some people hate what this country's become, want to return it to a good old day, whatever that good old day. It's always back in a time where racism was rampant, by the way, and black people were nothing. But, you know, good old day to them. So this is the problem. We have a conflict on what it means to be a good country. And no matter what you do, somebody's going to be ticked off about it. Well, let me tell you, peoples, the good old Jerusalem under Roman rule was not nearly as kind or loving or wonderful place to live as it is today in the United States of America, whether you're a right winger or a left winger, okay? We live in a much better circumstance than the people did 2,000 years ago under the thumb of Roman rule. We need to really, we, we lack gratitude, okay? We demonstrate our lack of understanding of history. Things are much better today than what they were then. You will likely live into your mid to late 70s, maybe 80s. Nobody lived that long back then. You will likely have food on your table. For some, it may be a little bit harder to get food on your table, but I guarantee you that for folks who have a hard time putting food on their table, even if, even if they're, they're struggling to put food on their table, uh, you're not going to starve to death. There's food in this country. It may not be a just way for food to be distributed, but there's food on people's tables and roofs over most people's heads. That was not true 2,000 years ago. People starved to death all the time, and there was no infrastructure and no help for them. We give what belongs to the country or to our government. Whether we live in a democracy or a totalitarian state like Russia, Jesus doesn't make a distinction. So I would say to you that Russia is probably a pretty good example of what it is like to live in Rome 2,000 years ago. That's kind of similar to the type of country in which Jesus would have been residing at that time. And Jerusalem was kind of like Ukraine, to be frank. They were ticking off the Roman emperor because of their rebellious zealots and they had to keep coming down on them to send more troops in and keeping them in line. Very similar circumstances. So Jesus is kind of like living in contemporary Ukraine and says, give to the Russian government what's theirs. Give to whatever, well, Obviously a little bit different today, so now, now a separate country. But at least from Russia's perspective, Ukraine should be a part of them. This is the type of conflict that we're talking about that's going on 2,000 years ago. And Jesus says, it's politics. It's about country. That's not who we are. So you can live as a Christian in a democratic country or a totalitarian state. And the answer is still the same. We have a duty to give willingly to country as a sign of our gratitude to God. We can disagree with our country. We could try to improve it. But how we respond is indicative of our relationship with God. And so if you're one of those that storm in the castle because we don't like this country, you are bringing shame to the kingdom of God. Because you've got this priority as your citizenship. What type of witness are you giving to Jesus Christ when you carry a gun and storm the Capitol? Just saying. It's not Jesus' witness. 
This goes both ways. The early church, just want to remind you, was a non-militant, pacifistic movement until the time of Constantine. And I am contending to you that the witness of the church was much more effective before we decided to start playing politics and getting involved with the politics of country. Once the church becomes militant, once it starts colluding with the people in power, it loses its moral authority to speak for and on behalf of the oppressed. I'm going to say that again. I mean this sincerely. Whether you're a right winger or a left winger, I don't care. I think it's okay to be a citizen of this country and vote and be involved. But when you confuse your politics with the kingdom of heaven and you try to impose a particular political ism, you are a part of the problem. You are confusing people about who Jesus Christ is because your politics are not of the kingdom of heaven, whether you're a right winger or a left winger. At best, the relative righteousness. So I want to say this again. Once the church becomes militant right-wingers, once the church becomes militant left-wingers, and you collude with power, you lose your moral authority to speak on behalf of the oppressed. I, I just, okay, got to do this. Going to tick you off. Kingdom of Heaven Jesus sits on the throne okay there's only one law that is called love and is motivated by the Holy Spirit in our hearts does that look like any earthly kingdom? Does that look like the United States? Does this look like the United States? Don't tell me you're trying to get this to happen in the United States because that's bull. You're trying to impose your political philosophy through the force of law and with a gun to try to make people act in the way that you want them to act. I, where's Jesus in that? There is no such thing as a Christian country. Because only in the kingdom of heaven does Jesus sit on the throne. The only law is the law of love, and it must be motivated by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So as soon as you pass one law, you cease to be a Christian nation. How many laws do the United States of America have? Oh, I don't know, billions. I don't know that anybody could ever keep track of them. As soon as the United States peace passed one law, it ceased uh, being able to claim that we're a Christian nation. <laughs> as soon as you have to say, well, we're gonna outlaw this. We're going to pass a law, even if you pass a law against murder. I think all of us agree murder is wrong. But as soon as you have to pass a law that says that murder is wrong, you cease to be a Christian country. Because Christian country doesn't have to pass a law. That law is love. is already written in our hearts and is motivated by the Holy Spirit because Jesus is sitting on the throne. We're not a Christian country. We've never been a Christian country. That is not the purpose of Christianity to enforce a particular political ism on people. Jesus reminds us we are dual citizens. Our priority is to the kingdom of heaven. But in terms of this country and the country we belong to, we just render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. We're citizens primarily of the kingdom of heaven. And one of the great things I will say about living in this country compared to, say, Russia. Russia, by the way, is inherently atheistic. That is a part of their philosophy. You can be a Christian in Russia. But if you were to ask people about God, they, most people in Russia would say, there is no God. It's stupid. It's from years and years and years of atheism being 
pushed in the country, but you can be a Christian. You've always been able to be a Christian in communist countries. You can be a Christian in China. You could be a Christian uh, in Soviet Russia. There were Christians all over the place. So it doesn't matter what country you belong to. But one of the things I do like about being a part of our country is that according to our country's constitution, right, who is the one from whom the law comes? It comes from God. Our rights, our rights, I should say, our rights cannot be abridged by government. It comes from something that transcends government itself, and that's God. Regardless of whether you're an atheist, or a Jew, or a Muslim, or a Christian, our rights cannot be transcend, or cannot be, uh, cannot be, uh, uh, those, our rights transcend the law of the government itself. It comes from outside the government. They cannot be abridged by government. I, I love that. So again, if, if you're an atheist, good for you. In our country, your rights cannot be abridged by government. Because government has limited authority. So one, that's one of the things that, in theory, is great about our country, until you get crazy people trying to impose their particular morality upon everybody, then we got a problem. But in theory, our freedoms cannot be abridged by government. However, even when living in totalitarian states, you can still be a citizen of God's kingdom. Because in the kingdom of heaven, no matter the rules and the regulations of the country in which we live, no matter how oppressive it is, you've been set free by God. You are free from the burdens of human regulations and how you live and think about your life. You are free from the oppression in terms of your faith and your relationship with God and other people. Jesus Christ sets us free. So I'm encouraging you to stop. Well, I'm encouraging you. We need to stop being a part of the problem as Christians to the conflict in this country. We stop when we recognize our priorities to the kingdom of heaven. The United States ain't the kingdom of heaven. And it's okay. You can certainly vote for and fight for what you think is the best way for this country to operate, but please do not conflate or confuse that with your priority to the kingdom of heaven. Don't conflate your vote for what you think is right for how this country operates with voting for Jesus. These are two separate kingdoms, people. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. To God, the things that are God's. Do the best we can as citizens to live a consistent life, to cut out a place for ourselves where we can be consistent in how we live our faith. But we are not here to impose that upon anybody. So be good citizens, certainly of our country, but mostly of the kingdom of heaven. Whew. I'm going to invite you to pray. I know many of you might may be upset with me. Um, I will be frank. If right-wing Christians and left-wing Christians are really ticked off with me, I guess I've probably done my job. That wasn't my intention. My intention is to call us to an accountability. We need to do better as Christians and not be a part of the conflict that exists in this country. We need to be a part of the solution. We don't do that by imposing our will through the threat of political violence or political legislation. We do it through love. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask uh, that you would help us have courage to live our citizenship as kingdom, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven in a way we're, we're, we're aliens on this planet. <laughs> We're, we're resident aliens in this country. 
We don't exactly belong here. Our true citizenship is the king of heaven. So we're guests of a country that is alien to us. The United States is not our country. It's not our home. The kingdom of heaven is our home. And so we are just welcome guests in this place called the United States of America or whatever country we happen to belong to. And so we need to act like that. I'm afraid that we Christians have really given the name of Jesus um, an unfortunate amount of baggage and damaged the name of Jesus and brought a lack of credibility to the name of Jesus by our political activity that we conflate and confuse with acting on the name of Jesus. So help us to live a different way. Let us keep separate and understand the distinction between being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and a citizen of this country, because they're two separate things. Let us render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but to God what is God's. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You are welcome to respond to me. I encourage a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. I encourage you to disagree. It's okay. As I said at the beginning, we're not a church that imposes a particular point of view. What I express to you today is my interpretation based on what I read in the scripture. It is not the interpretation. God may be telling you something different. So I encourage you to have a discussion. Don't get angry. Come and let's talk about it. And let's pray about how we can be better citizens of God's kingdom and of this country, one that does not include violence or hatred of others. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord bless you and keep you and send you forth in his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.